Please welcome Professor Paul. This title, uh, Unfinished Modernizations. Um, there's a lot of unfinished business that we have to attend to, and I like the plural as well. Uh, about uh, four years ago, I was invited to South Korea to chair a jury that was going to judge ideas about building a new city. Uh, about 200 kilometers south of Seoul. I was rather suspicious of the uh, invitation since I'd never been invited to anything like that before. Uh, but it turned out to be genuine and I arrived there and I got off on very good footing with the person who was doing all of this. I kind of said, look, it's very surprising you have me here. Um, you've built about uh, 20 or so new cities over the last 30 years and they're all bloody awful and he said yeah yeah he said I built most of them <laughs> and uh, it turned out that uh, for the first time he was going to be able to do something that wasn't actually captive to the construction uh, companies and felt he wanted to do something a bit unusual uh, the jury was a very interesting experience uh, we started off by having a discussion about what kind of criteria we might use to uh, make uh, our judgments. And uh, the jury was made up of uh, half the Korean and the other half were foreigners. And uh, most people were engineers or planners uh, or architects and or designers. And I was probably the only social scientist uh, in, in the group. And we quickly got into a discussion between uh, two of the more eminent uh, architects in the group, uh, a Japanese architect, the Sasaki, and a Dutch architect, uh, Winnie Mass. And I'll caricature a bit for the sake of the story. But it really turned on the question of what is more powerful symbolically and more powerful uh, in terms of absorbing all kinds of possibilities uh, when you compare cubes with, with circles. Uh, now I found this a little frustrating after a bit. So I said, well I thought there are other criteria that we ought to look at. And uh, I listed uh, at the time uh, six or seven uh, and these criteria consisted of the following. I said, we should really be very concerned about the kind of relation to nature that is being proposed in these ideas. What kind of way are we thinking about the carbon footprint? What kind of ways are we thinking about aesthetic judgments of you know, personal relation to nature and all the rest of it? And I thought that was a very important uh, element in, in many of the designs. Um, <coughs> We had looked at the site and one of the things that struck me was there was this huge flood plain and wouldn't it be fun if uh, it flooded every now and again. So and one of the designs actually suggested that every now and again it should and I thought that was an interesting idea. So, so there was that and then I said and the second criteria should be what kind of technologies are going to be embedded uh, in this city? Uh, communication and transport technologies, what kinds of... Uh, household technologies and, and, and the like. Uh, and that was, I think, a very important thing. And it was not independent of the relation to nature, obviously, the, the choice of technologies uh, over issues like uh, waste disposal and waste recirculation and recycling and so on was going to be very important. So that there was some relationship between the choices of technologies and the relation to nature. And I went on in this fashion and said, the third thing you want to look at is the nature of the social relations and how is this place going to work in terms of those dominant social relations. Now the problem in this case was that the city was mainly going to be populated by uh, the sort of ministries of, uh, of government plus scientific technical uh, organization and research institutes and things like that and my experience of those kinds of cities is that 
socially some of the most boring places you've ever been in. So what could you do about that? And I thought that one of the ways you would deal with that was be to hide the ministries so you didn't even know you were in a place where there were lots of ministries. I mean, you could hide them behind hills. And this led me to say, well, I don't like this thing where they've got a big ceremonial kind of central thing and, and, and ministry, you know, oh, they're so boring. Um, so, so there was that, that sort of issue uh, of, of, of social relations, but obviously, so, uh, social structure, uh, gender relations, those sorts of issues should be taken very much into account in the design. So what would, what would the design say about those sorts of uh, questions? There was then the kind of issue of production. What, what was this place going to produce? Well, it was largely going to produce uh, bureaucratic decisions and scientific uh, knowledge and all the rest of it. But in association with that, it was likely to produce a lot of waste paper. Uh, so maybe we should have a waste cycling plant in the middle of the place, uh, and, and uh, so on. Uh, but uh, there were also ancillary things that m might actually form the basis for an alternative kind of economy, which is that if you took printing and publishing and, and you know, illustrated materials, that maybe you could have a whole kind of area of the city that was given over to innovations in, in that kind of, kind of area. So there was a whole kind of question of uh, production. Uh, to be taken into account. And then there were issues about, well, how, how was daily life going to be led? What was it going to be like uh, reproducing with children and, and what were going to be relations on the streets and how was leisure going to be organized and you know, things of that sort. So that there was a, a sort of daily life criteria. What would be, it be like? I mean, what I was nervous about was that everybody, you know, would, would be there and they'd work there during the week and then they'd disappear back to Seoul on the weekend to have a good time, you know, and uh, in a sense, you'd want to try to counteract that somehow or other by what was being done. And then there was an issue of, uh, of uh, mental conceptions of the world, you know. It's always struck me ever since I've been reading about urbanization that you know, the Greeks have this kind of statement that kind of says, we make the house and the house makes us. Uh, what kind of people would we be made by constructing this environment in a particular way that it was being constructed? Uh, and so the mental conceptions that would flow from that, uh, and this would in, even include uh, political subjectivities, I mean, one of the places I, I, I sort of uh, urban environments I don't like very much are the, uh, the American suburbs. Partly because it seems to me the people who've learned to live in the American suburbs have assumed a certain persona, uh, which frankly is politically retrograde and it's exclusive and it votes Republican and does all kinds of things like that. And in fact, one of my secret plans is to sort of destroy the American suburbs and then hope that the place will see some sense instead of what it's doing right now, which is spouting utter nonsense, which is much of it suburban based. So there's a, there's a question of the mental conceptions and political subjectivities that would flow in relationship to that. I thought that was a very important thing to think about. And then I would add, and I, I'm now adding, you know, since I've been sort of trying to articulate this more, more fully, uh, I would then add the kind of institutional arrangements of, of governance and government, uh, how they would be organized. Would you have neighborhood assemblies? If you had neighborhood assemblies, would you have neighborhood governments? And if so, how would the whole kind of governance structure work and decisions be made? So I said, I thought all of these uh, ought to be taken into account. And it, it should be clear that none of these is really independent of the others, that they all hang together as um, words I would use as moments within an assemblage or within an ensemble of relationships. And so that the idea of the city would be about a city that was being constructed along all of these dimensions and interrelation with each other. But also that the city should be allowed to grow so that and change, so that we'd have to think of those relations as being perpetually dynamic. Uh, that they would evolve over time and that, that this would make uh, it not just simply a city that gets constructed and then finished, it, became, it is perpetually, as it were, an unfinished uh, product and was therefore perpetually in, in evolution. So I made this argument and we talked about this idea for about you know, 10 or 15 minutes and then Isazaki got very, very impatient with this and he said, well, you know, this is all very well, but this is far too complicated. You can't possibly work all of this out. We have to prioritize here. And there's only one of these things that really, really is central. 
and that is mental conceptions. And of the mental conceptions, it's the symbolic dimension that is most significant, and I think that circles are far preferable to squares. Now, when architects do that kind of thing to you, you want to shoot them, you know. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that to this audience, I suppose. But, you know, so I kind of said, oh, okay, all right. I thought I was put in my place by the famous architects, you know. So they got back to a discussion about circles and squares for the rest of the time. But what was then interesting was later on, um, and I had no idea how much this sort of stuff I was saying actually influenced what was, what was being judged. I noticed a couple of things came through that seemed to me to have only come through because people were thinking about the sorts of things I'd suggested. But uh, that evening at uh, dinner, it was very interesting, sort of, uh, both Isazaki and Winnie Mask kind of said to me, uh, well, you know, those are very interesting ideas about cities. I mean, have you ever written this up, or has anybody else ever written this up, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, I mean, we'd like to go read about it. And I said, well, I said, you can go read about it if you want. I said, it's, it's footnote four in chapter 15 of Marx's Capital, volume one. <laughs> Well, there are two things that happen to you when you say something like that. One is the spectre of Marx creeps in and they all kind of go, oh my God, he's in the room. Oh Lord, what's going to happen to my job prospects and all kinds of things? I'm not getting more commissions if I have this on my back, you know. So that's one thing that happens. The other thing is that people look at you as you're an utter idiot because you've never had a single idea in your own head. All you've ever done is go around and spout marks. And even worse, in this instance, you're spouting a footnote in marks. You know, so that ended the conversation, as it were, about that. But since then, I've been working on these ideas, and in a book I just finished called The Enigma of Capital, I spend a, a lot of time on this. And when I teach capital, uh, I always spend a lot of time on that footnote because I think it, it says to me something about what Marx is doing. You know, there are all these great one-liners about Marx saying this, you know, class, you know, old history is the history of class struggle or uh, the productive forces uh, generate, you know, all these kinds of one-liners. But I always try to say to students when they're reading this stuff, don't take any notice of those one-liners. Look at what he actually does in his analysis. And what he does when he's writing capital is there is embedded in there an argument about how capitalism arose out of feudalism. And actually when you look at the argument, it says that all that capitalism arose out of, social, out of, out of feudalism, uh, moving on all of those dimensions. Yeah, there's a technological dimension which is often made much of. But actually in capital, that's the last thing that happens in the story is when the factory system comes online and, and starts to, to, to take over. Uh, there's a transformation of social relations, obviously. Huge transformation in social relations involved. Mental conceptions of the world had to change dramatically. And the relation to nature, of course, changed. And nature became something radically different in relationship to capital than it had been before. Nature before was alive and uh, vibrant and organic. Uh, but under capitalism, it became rather, rather dead. It became something instrumentally to be used. Uh, so the transformation of mental conceptions about the relation to nature and the actual transformation of the relation to nature was very dramatic. So I said, well, say to my students, look, uh, what Marx is doing here is in this little uh, uh, footnote is to say to you, you read this in the light of this footnote, and what you see is a whole theory, a dialectics, if you like, of social change. And if that's the way in which capitalism arose out of feudalism, then shouldn't we think about the rise of socialism or communism or whatever you want to call the alternative to what we now live under? If there is going to be some macro transition of some sort, then it has to be across all of those dimensions. It cannot be uh, along any one of them. Uh, now, it's very interesting when you look at many social theories. Many social theories select one of them and say, this is the one that really matters, like Isazaki said. Idealists will say it's mental conceptions that really change the world. Uh, institutionalists will say it's changing institutional forms. Environmentalists, some of them will say it's the relation to nature, which is really kind of fundamental. Others will say it's social relations, it's the class struggle or the gender struggle or something like that. 